Hi, I guess we start now. I'm as a track chair at track chair on site building. I'm excited to have Susan Kennedy here today, who will be speaking on multilingual content in Drupal 7 and 8. Suzanne has been a co-founder of Evolving Web in Canada and has plenty of experience with enterprise-level Drupal implementations. She's also presented at numerous live, uh, web conferences on Drupal topics, several Drupal topics, including multilingual content. And at the moment, she's cooperating with Acquia to set up the first full day training on multilingual. And well, come her uh, to speak on that topic today here. Thanks. So Drupal is a content management system. So when we talk about making a multilingual Drupal site, one of the first things we have to think about is translating content. And some Drupal websites have so much content that it becomes uh, a, really, a really important thing to consider when you're setting up a multilingual site. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, I guess Daniel already introduced me, so I, this is all covered. If you're interested in our multilingual training course, you can find out more at evolvingweb.ca. So today we'll be talking a little bit about multilingual sites and what that means in Drupal. And then we'll be focusing on uh, translating content and the new translation um, method of field level translation that's available in Drupal 7. That's really exciting. And that's gaining momentum um, to become really uh, more part of Drupal 8 and the standard way to translate content in Drupal. We'll also be touching a bit on um, translation workflows for content. Uh, there's a new module out for that called the Translation Management Tool that's really exciting. And, uh, and I'll, I'll be covering a bit about um, which aspects of content translation are changing for Drupal 8 um, and what that means for you as a site builder. So one of the reasons that multilingual features are so difficult to deal with in Drupal is that every website seems to have a different set of multilingual requirements. There's so many reasons these days to build a multilingual uh, platform. Um, you might want to reach a, a wider audience or expand to new markets, so you might be looking to add languages to your site for that reason. You might be looking to improve uh, usability for, for multilingual users. For search engine optimization, if people are, are searching for, for information in a different language, of course, they're not going to find your site unless your site's been translated. And in some places, there's government regu regulations or maybe a company policy that's forcing you to, to translate your site. So sometimes it's not really the choice of the, the site builder. So while there's all kinds of reasons to make your site multilingual, there's also a lot of resources that you're going to need to put together a, a multilingual project. So there's translators, user interface translators, as well as content translators. You're going to have to QA the site in, in um, multiple languages. And you might even need a translation manager to manage all the translation workflows for the content that you set up. So it can be quite a bit of overhead. Um, and then you might be relying on resources like translations from localize.drupal.org or machine translations from Google Translate to get your, your content translated initially. So just to understand a bit better the terminology before we get started, um, internationalization as a site builder is your responsibility. So you're enabling translation and localization to take place. So you're separating out elements in the site, like text, date formats, things like that, that need to be localized so that uh, translators or site maintainers can come along and specify those for each language. And then localization includes translation of text, but it can also include things like translating currencies, time zones. Sometimes there's different legal requirements in different places, so the content needs to be different. So before you get started, it's really important to understand um, 
what the requirements are, how many languages you're adding to the site, does the user interface need to be fully translated, does the content need to be fully translated, sometimes you have a different content set in each language, and getting these, getting these requirements down is, is really important. Another thing we'll talk about is untranslated content. Almost every multilingual site is going to have some content that's untranslated, and whether you show untranslated content in other languages or not can be a, a tricky issue that you need to figure out um, before you start building views and deciding um, what the language fallback uh, should be. So for, uh, for cases where you have a multilingual audience, users who speak more than one language, that might impact your, your choices there. So that's a bit of an overview of what multilingual site building means. But what does that mean for us with Drupal? How does that translate into Drupal, the Drupal world? So with Drupal, you can build a foreign language site. You can install a language other than English um, when you're installing Drupal. And you need the locale module to do that. And your content and your user interface and things like menus, you'll set up in, in another language. You can also have a multilingual site, so a site where the user interface is in, available in more than one language, where things like menus and blocks and things are, are translated with the I18N module. Um, and then the locale module also lets you choose uh, a language for each piece of content you're creating, each, each node you're creating. So you can flag nodes in different languages. But things get a little bit trickier when you introduce translation. So when you introduce content translation, you are not just flagging nodes as being in a certain language and targeting them at users in that language. You're actually uh, putting translations of content, uh, you're relating them together, mapping them together in a, in a set of translations. So that when a user hits the language switcher, they're switching from, say, the About Us page in French to the About Us page in English. So that ability to translate content um, is sort of an extra layer. And we can, we can do this with Drupal core using node level translation, uh, just like in Drupal 6. Uh, and we can also do this using field tr level translation if you enable the, if you install the contributed entity translation module. And that choice of which method to use is, is going to be a, a main focus of, the, of this presentation. So how, how many out there have used the entity translation module? Oh, wow. There's a lot of you. OK. Great. So types of text in Drupal. There's all kinds of, of text in Drupal that needs to get translated. User interface text in code. User interface text that you specify as the site administrator, the site builder. Um, there's I18N strings, which are things like blocks and menus. Um, there's variables that need to get translated, like the site title. And then there's content. So a lot of what you have to translate is, is content. Um, and there's different translation interfaces for this in Drupal, which is part of what makes multilingual websites seem so difficult, especially to site administrators, authors, translators. There's all these ways of translating text. And the really exciting thing about entity translation and Drupal 7 is that more and more things are falling into the category of content, because in Drupal 6, content just meant nodes. But now in Drupal 7, content means nodes and taxonomy terms and users. And if you're installing contributed modules that provide additional entities, then those are content as, as well. Um, and we'll see with Drupal 8 which things are entities and which things aren't. I know there's still a lot of conversations going on about that. Um, but hopefully more and more things will be able to, tra will be able to translate um, as entities. So when you start off planning how content is going to get translated in your site, um, one of the first things you need to think about is what kind of language experience you're building for your users. 
Are you building a fully symmetric experience where everything is translated? This is a site I built for Travelocity and every single node had to get translated before it was published. So we didn't have any untranslated fields, or if we did, it was a bug. And then other sites, you go to them and you switch the language and the, the whole structure of the content changes. So you have a very asymmetric experience. And along with this, you have to think about untranslated content and whether that's going to show up or not. And you need to remember that untranslated content um, can be very valuable because some fields are kind of language independent. So just because a node hasn't been translated, it doesn't mean it's not valuable to the user. If you're looking at a list of comments or reviews and there's star ratings that users have given to a restaurant, it's useful to see that 20 users gave this restaurant a five-star rating, even if you don't understand what their comment is. So starting to think about content and um, whether it's translatable, whether it's language independent or language specific is a really important part of planning out your, your multilingual content. Other sites you'll want to hide untranslated content. So uh, that, that can be a matter of the policy of uh, your organization or politics or, or whatnot. So content translation methods. There's two methods of translating content in Drupal 7, which means extra work for site builders who have to make sense of this and decide which option to choose. We have more options now than ever, so building a multilingual site is even harder than in Drupal 6 in certain ways. Um, we have node level translation, which means that every time you translate a piece of content, or a, every time you translate a node, you're creating a new node. And those all live together in a translation set, um, but they're separate nodes. And then field level translation is when you have one node and you're just translating the fields on the nodes. So there's a lot of shared properties, or you can have shared fields on that node where um, certain fields don't get translated. But there's only one node. So that's the, the main difference. You have Node-level translation and field-level translation. So node-level translation is provided by the content translation module. Um, you're creating a new node for each translation and you're mapping them together. And they're all referring back to the original node that was translated. So they all have um, a translation uh, node ID. But you can see here that if I'm creating three nodes, and the image is the same for each of those nodes, if I'm creating three articles, let's say, then I have to upload the article, the image three times, and it's saved three times in Drupal. And that seems a little bit um, wasteful. But there's benefits to this system, too, because, um, because these nodes are independent, you can set all the properties for them separately. You can have menu systems that are asymmetric because you have nodes that uh, you're, you're setting the menu setting for each node individually rather than for one node that applies to all the translations. You can also do things like content curation for language. Um, and node translation is sort of what Drupal expects in a way. I mean, that's what everybody used in Drupal 6. So things like but built-in functionality like search is just going to work. You search for a node, you're going to find the node you know, in, in the original language or in one of the other languages. It'll return a node and it'll display the fields to you in, in the language that the node is in. There's also some features like there's a built-in flag saying that content, the content needs to be updated or the translation needs to be updated, and that's built in with no level translation. But there's also a lot of drawbacks because with no level translation, everything is language specific. Like I said, that image that's going to be the same for all three nodes is set to be language uh, specific. You can 
synchronize data between nodes if you use the synchronize translations module, but this still ends up, you're still storing the data for each node. Um, and you can synchronize everything with node level translation. You can only synchronize fields and certain properties. You can't synchronize things like uh, a user bookmarking uh, a node. It's not built in. You'd have to figure out a workaround yourself. And also, node level translation only works for nodes. So if you're adding another type of entity, this method of translation isn't going to work. So the UI for translating a node with node level translation, it adds a translate tab. You click add translation and it adds a new node. And then you have all the, the properties of the node are there. When you're adding a translation, you have the full UI for creating a node, which means that you're setting all of these, these properties again. So things like the author and the post date, those are all set individually for each translation. So menu settings, publish date, all those properties that aren't, aren't uh, that are attached to nodes, that are often the same across languages. So what's our alternative? Field level translation. Field tra level translation is actually provided by a module called entity translation, so it can be a little confusing, the terminology. Um, the field translation mechanism itself is in core, and the entity translation module gives us the UI for translating, uh, for translating fields. So with field level translation, like I said, you have one node, and you select which fields are translatable. So let's say I want the title and body to be translatable. I can specify that those are the translatable things, and everything else by default will be the same in all languages. And that everything else applies to things like properties of nodes, which you can't translate using field level translation. But it also applies to all kinds of other features that you might add to a node. When you think about building a Drupal site, it's more than just core Drupal. There's all kinds of functionality that gets added to nodes. Nodes are kind of these, these uh, dynamic things that we turn into events and groups and um, that we put in calendars, and, uh, and so these are all kind of language-independent features that you can't synchronize across translations. So if you have more than one node, you have to figure out how to get your sign-up list to be synchronized across the French node and the English node. If you have a, an event or something in um, two languages, it doesn't mean that there's two events. It doesn't mean that you want users to sign up to two separate things. You just want them to sign up to one thing, and you just probably want to translate the title and description, maybe a couple other fields. So there's a lot of benefits to field level translation. Again, no need to sync properties. You only have one node ID to deal with, and it works for all kinds of entities. So I'm talking mostly about nodes here, comparing it to node level translation, but of course it also works for taxonomy terms, users, and other entities that um, you can add to your site. There are some drawbacks. You know, entity translation is new, so things like core search unfortunately doesn't work with uh, field level translation. This, the core search is only going to display content in the original language of the node. Also things like revisions, if you, um, if you translate a node and you make changes to the translation, that those aren't going to show up in the list of revisions for the node. So there's a lot of built-in functionality that we take for granted as site builders that just isn't going to be there. It's also a slightly different UI for translators to learn, so that's something to take into account. It's easy enough for us to figure it out, but um, for translators that can be difficult, especially if you have these two methods living together on the same site. Um, and then there's some features of the I18N module that are meant for node level translation, like, like node options, choosing the, the default language of, of nodes, um, multilingual select doesn't work, things like that. Um, and you can't translate properties. 
So everything is assumed to be the same across languages. Um, in Drupal 8, properties are supposed to be translatable. There's work being done on that as we speak. So that'll be kind of fixed for Drupal 8. But for Drupal 7, it's still something you have to consider. So if you want to include um, content in different menus depending on the language, or if you want to include a different author depending on the language, you can't do that with field level translation, um, at least not easily. So setting up field translation for a content type. The great thing is that we can choose which method we want to use per content type. We don't have to make a choice for our whole Drupal site. Once you have chosen with that you want to use field level translation, you go in and specify which fields you want to make translatable. So you, you edit the field and it's just part of the settings to enable translation for the field. Now, like I said, you can't translate properties and the title of a node happens to be a property and it also happens to be something that you'll definitely want to translate. So you'll need, if you're using entity translation, you'll need the title module um, to make the title into a field. So you're converting the title to a field so that it can be translatable. So once you have translatable fields, you're adding a translation just like you would for node level translation, except that you're not adding a new node when you hit trans add translation. And the actual interface for adding a translation only gives you access to the translatable fields. So all of those language independent fields and all the properties for the node, like the menu settings that you're used to seeing at the bottom of the node creation page, those are only editable on the original node. So that's why the interface can be a little confusing for translators because they're not used to seeing this, you know, only the translatable fields UI. So how do you choose field versus node level translation? I just want to go through a few examples. Um, so something like a session at a conference or an event has things like a date and time, um, a location, these are things that you want to be the same across nodes. So these are fields that you could synchronize, but with field translation, it's nice because you just choose not to translate them. Things like an item and a carousel. So for building a carousel, you usually have an order that items appear in. And you might be using something like node queue or uh, draggable views module to set up this ordering system. And if you have a node for each language, you probably want the order to be the same across languages, um, but there's, you know, the, the node queue only expects one node per item in the carousel. So using um, field level translation for this is, is really nice. There are some things that, there are some types of content um, where the language specific features are really important, like for a web form, if you want to translate components, you have to have separate components for each web form. There is a web form localization module that you can use, but if you're not using that, you'll want your, um, you'll want your web forms to use node level translation and be separate nodes. So making this decision for your content types is part of the site building process and it's something that, you know, it's, it's, it provides us a lot of opportunities as site builders, but as I mentioned, it, it is a challenge. Um, and another important thing to consider um, when you're making this choice is the workflow that a node goes through. So the life cycle of a node, I mean, this is, could just be a basic node. Node starts out in a CSV and you import it into the site and then you, someone comes along and publishes it and a user likes it and someone updates it. And it is kind of a pain, node level translation, having to do this for multiple nodes at each stage. You're importing many nodes, you're publishing them. Um, so although many workflow modules expect uh, not, not to use 
field level translation. Um, if you're building your own workflow, it's, it's really nice just to be dealing with one node per piece of content on your site. And this is kind of liberating, um, especially as we move forward and field level translation is better supported. So I think field level translation is the best mo data model for most use cases, but it might not always be practical. So because of the limitations, things like not, not support, not, uh, they're not being support for core search, it might not be practical for you to, to use this method for every site you're building, but it is the future and, uh, and it's, it's really exciting, I think. Um, so also, it works for other types of entities. So we've been talking mostly about nodes and content types and, and things, but it works for uh, users, comments, taxonomy terms, and especially when we're talking about taxonomy terms, I think this is a really great uh, method to use for translating them. So when you're translating users, for example, that translate tab is there. It's the same mechanism where you're setting up which fields should be translatable, selecting those. One thing to keep in mind is that there's only one permission for translating user entities in Drupal. So if you, if you need to have users translating their own profiles, this isn't gonna work because you can't give everybody access to edit everybody's uh, user profile. It's probably not a good idea. Um, and also, because of the UI being a little bit different than standard Drupal, uh, users might find it kind of confusing. But for tra translating taxonomy terms, I think it's a really great um, model to use. So you have a translate tab on each taxonomy term. You can replace the taxonomy term name and description um, and make those fields, again, with the, the title module. And there is only one permission, but that's probably something you can give to your site administrators. And if you really want to, you can translate comments. I don't know a lot of good use cases for this. I was trying to come up with some. Um, maybe, maybe for machine translation it makes sense, but it's, uh, it's something to consider. And then, of course, you can translate other entities. So a lot of the modules that you probably use, um, they provide entities. And if an entity is fieldable, if it has fields, and if it has translation support in the hook entity info, then, then you can translate it. So things like the commerce product entity, I think this is fantastic for anyone who's tried to build a multilingual uh, e-commerce store before. It's, it's a real pain to try and figure out how to make products that are translated, but that are only one product. Um, and a lot of people end up using workarounds, like having one node and adding a, a title field for all the other languages, things like that. So it's really great that we can use um, entity translation for this. So all the, all the views that the commerce module is providing really assumes that there's only one, no, one um, product entity for each product in your store. So things like the number of products left that you have in your inventory, that's only kept track of um, for each node. So if you're doing translations, um, it, can, it can be really difficult to implement using uh, node level translation. So content translation workflows. I've had a lot of people ask me, um, you know, I just downloaded Drupal and I made a multilingual site and none of, the, none of the site is translated. What's going on? People expect that Drupal's just going to translate their site for them when they install a new language, which is, which is uh, you know, that would be nice. Um, translation is really expensive, especially when you're adding a lot of languages. I did a site 
with eight languages that had thousands of nodes, and their translation budget was, uh, had to be pretty high, and they were definitely taking advantage of machine translation. Um, it also takes a long time sometimes to send a translation off to a translation service, um, and translators sometimes aren't used to working with tools like Drupal, so it can be expensive to have to train translators um, to come in and translate all your content or your UI. People think, or I shouldn't say people, uh, some people think that translation workflows should be really simple. You know, you add a new node and then someone comes along and translate it, translates it. But as we saw earlier, you know, the life cycle of a node, nodes get published and updated and, and deleted and every time um, a node gets updated, of course the translator has to come along and do an update as well. So you can do a translation workflow from scratch, just setting up the permissions for your translators, using rules to uh, trigger emails when uh, translations are required, creating views for translators so they know what, what's left, what needs to be translated. But there's limitations in Drupal for things like translation permissions. Um, and you have to give your translators permission to do a lot in order for them to effectively translate your site. You can use the IAT9 access module to give more granular permissions, but it's still in dev for Drupal 7, and I'm not quite sure how stable it is yet. So there's, there's a lot of challenges to setting this up. So that's why the translation um, management tool module, the TMGMT module, is so exciting, because um, the module tries to address a lot of these issues with uh, content translation workflows. Um, and how it works is it's a, it's a module you install in Drupal, and then you can add plugins to pull in translations from other services. So Google and Bing are machine translation services. Um, there's also human translation services that it plugs into as well. So you can you add these translators to your site. You usually have to sign up for an account. So if you want Microsoft machine translation, you have to sign up for a Microsoft account. Um, and the same goes for the human translation services as well. But once you've, once you've set that up, um, you can request a translation for any of your types of content. So the translate tab is still there, and you can use this with node level translation or field level translation. Um, and you can still add a translation right in Drupal. That, that UI is still there. It's still working just the same way as before. Um, but you have this extra uh, action that you can do requesting a translation for the content. And then you can choose which, whichever translator you want to use. So you can choose your machine translation service or the other service. And once the translation's back in Drupal, you can review it. So you have this nice UI showing you the original content and the, uh, and the translation that was pulled in. So if you're using machine translation, it's instant. I'm not sure how long the human translation services take, um, but once it's in Drupal, you, you, have a, you have a message that appears and you can review the content before it gets published to the site. So it doesn't automatically get published. You can set up workflows for um, someone to review it in Drupal. And you can also do translation in bulk. So you can do it on the node level or you can actually um, translate a set of nodes at once. Um, and this works for nodes, it works for other entities too if you're using field level translation. And there's work being done, I think, to make it work for all other kinds of um, strings, so other text groups in Drupal, like uh, blocks and menus and whatnot. So really exciting. Um, it's really easy to set up, so I recommend giving it a try. And if you want to use another translation service, like translations.com or something, you can write your own plugin. It's, it's totally pluggable. So it, it gives you that um, 
it takes care a lot of a lot of the Drupal work for you, and then it's just integrating it with other APIs that, that you would have to do. Oh, and I wanted to do, I think I have time to do a demo, which I know they tell you you're not supposed to do in a DrupalCon presentation, but it's gonna be short. So I have this node here in English. Sir? Oh, <laughs> this is why they tell you not to do it, right? Okay, so I have this node in English, ice fishing in the Arctic. And I hit translate, and like I, I was saying, I can add a translation. This is using field level translation here. Um, but I also have this nice checkbox over here for, oh great, I already, I already translated this one, okay. This is why they tell you not to do a lot of presentations. Great, not translated. Ice climbing in southern Ontario. Really fun, extreme sport. Okay, so as you see, there is no translation here. I can request a translation. And it's gonna take me to this UI that I was showing you before, um, where I can choose which translator I wanna use. And I think I wanna use Google Translator. You know, you have to pay like a very minor amount, like, but it's, it's worth it, this one works. So I'm gonna choose that and hit Submit to Translator. And it's right back, like instantly, because it's Google Translate, right? So, and I only translated one sentence. So I can review my translations and then hit accept. And the translation is going to appear on the site. Yay! Okay, there's special character in the title, but we can make a bug for that later. Um, okay, I'll go back to my slides. So there's still a lot of challenges for multilingual in Drupal 8. Like I mentioned, choosing a translation um, method for content is something more to think about. Um, permissions for translators aren't ideal and um, choosing which contributed modules you can use that are not gonna break your multilingual setup, that can still be uh, very challenging. Translating custom elements, so things like web form, there's a web forms localization module, but it's not perfect yet. So there's still a lot of, a lot of things that uh, make, make it difficult, but but I think, uh, I think field level translation is exciting and, and makes up for a lot of these challenges. So looking forward to Drupal 8, translation prop, translatable properties are hopefully going to make it so that we can just use field level translation and node level translation won't be necessary. Uh, maybe more things will be entities, so we'll have more things that we can translate with field level translation. Hopefully, we'll have a better UI for adding and configuring languages. I know there's a lot of work already being done on that for the Drupal 8 multilingual initiative. And if you want to know more about what's coming up, um, Gabor is doing a core conversation tomorrow at 1 o'clock. So you should come and find out what's going on with the code sprint. Two um, contributed modules for entity translation that I just wanted to throw out there. So if you're writing down a list of modules to try when you get home, jot these ones down. Um, entity translation feeds allows you to import, um, import entities with translated fields. And I mentioned that the entity uh, 
entity translation doesn't work with core search, but if you're using search API, you can try out the search API entity translation module. It's still in development, but it might make it possible for you to add search to your, uh, for your field translated content. There's a lot more coming up this week in terms of um, multilingual sessions and bops. So tomorrow, if you wanna come and complain about all the problems you've been having with multilingual Drupal, we're gonna get together at 10, 15 and do a bop and um, hopefully get some answers to some of your questions, if you have any, after, after the session today. Um, there's a multilingual Apache Solar Bop today at 5 p.m., so I guess coming up soon. And localized.drupal.org bop, for those of you not using um, localization update yet for your multilingual site, you should come on out and learn about it. Or if you want to contribute translations to uh, localized.drupal.org, find out more about that. There's a TMGMT bop on Thursday. That's the translation management tool module that I just demoed. So if you want to come do some bug reports for the bugs that we uncovered in this demo, then come help out with that. And then there's a multilingual code sprint for the Drupal 8 multilingual initiative um, that's going Friday to Sunday. Um, so if you want to contribute, make field translation work better, then come on out to that. Well, so that's it. I didn't add, you're supposed to fill out a survey, so you should do that. I was supposed to add a slide. And if you have any questions, we have lots of time, so. Mm -hmm. If you're using, are, are you talking about no translation or? Oh, I see. Okay, so he's asking if you are using um, field level translation, is it possible to have a default image that the, is set in the original language that a translator can override? Um, not, not currently, not, yes? Uh, Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's a good. But, but okay. So if you're if you're displaying your content in a view um, with the entity translation module, there's a setting for whether content uses the language fallback or not. So if you have um, if you have it using the language fallback, that means that if a field hasn't been translated, um, that it'll, it'll show up in the original language. So if you're showing a list of articles and you want the image to show up in the original language, if it hasn't been added for the translation, then you can do that. Um, does that sort of help? <laughs> so you should, you should always use views when you're displaying content in any form. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. So we, I always use image as this great example of something that is language neutral, but of course if you have um, an alt text attached to the image, that needs to get translated as well. So the only way to deal with that is to add an extra field for your alt text um, that you can translate. So that's a, that's a nice workaround, but it's not, it's not ideal.
Yeah, so menus, you, because, because a menu setting is um, a property, you can't translate it with field level translation in Drupal 7. So if you want to include a node in, more, in a different menu or a different place in the menu for, a diff for each language, then you, have to, then you have to use node level translation. So if you are using field level translation and you add the node to a menu in the original language, it's going to show up in all languages in that place. The menu, um, yeah, and then if you're using menu translation, you can translate the menu link because that's translatable with the menu translation module. Just like if you're adding um, a view to your menu, that is only in um, one language. But you want the, the you want the menu link itself to be translated, so it, it works using the IETN menu translation module. Yeah. The body. Oh, the path is tra is translatable. It's a uh, special. <laughs> yeah, it's there. You can translate it for sure. That's yeah. The URL of the um, of the node, if you're using field level translation, is translatable. I think that that would be a huge reason not to use the module. It's very key. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Okay, so um, it's a question about the default language, and you can change the default language in your site to be something other than English. Yeah, yeah, so he's like, so it's sometimes a, a problem is that you have users who speak a certain language like Portuguese or uh, Brazilian Portuguese, and you don't want the language fall back to be English, you want it to be Portuguese, um, because it's way more similar to Brazilian Portuguese than English. Um, I don't believe there's any plans for, oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, so the, the, the answer from Platt, who's, uh, who wrote the NTT translation module here, um, is that you can, you can uh, it's extensible, so you can code that yourself. In Drupal 8, it's more, much more flexible. Is that, oh, also in Drupal 7. The whole detection and selection and language negotiation system in Drupal 7 uh, is a lot more flexible, so. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing. Yeah, so the I18N module, you still need to use it for translating menus and blocks and all those other things that aren't uh, content. So yeah, you, st you need to use that no matter whether you're using field level translation or node level translation.
I don't believe so. So the question is about translation of um, when you're translating content, um, what to do if the translator forgets to translate certain fields that, um, and, and if there's a way to treat them, treat those, treat that content differently in Vue when you're displaying it. Is that correct? Yes. Um, I'm not sure, I don't know. Does anyone know how to answer this question? I don't know, it sounds like, it sounds like you know, you'd have to look at the specific case. And there's no, there's not gonna be, flag, there's like adding a flag to a field isn't. Okay. Um, well, there is a setting for whether the language fallback is used with entity translation. So, but that's but that's just one setting for the whole site. So, so it's a setting. It's a setting for whether you know if you if you have con certain fields that aren't translated, whether or not to show that content in the original language or not. Um, but that's. I mean, you could use that, but it's not. Probably, I mean, it's the one setting for the whole site, so you'd kind of have to make that decision. Are there any other? Yeah. So, when you're translating the, the screen of the site, so do you make it a different language to use by people who think that it's completely natural? So, what you do is you really fold everything into that other screen. Mm -hmm. Um, so the question is about translating strings and whether you can export um, only strings for certain parts of Drupal, like certain modules or themes. Um, that's more a question about the user interface than about content, I guess. So there's... Um, I mean, you can create PO files for each. You have P PO files for each module that you can import from localized.drupal.org. Um, if you want to override those, then you know it's going to. Sorry, I don't have. The, I don't think I have a good answer for that right now. Does any, did anyone have another question over here, or is that yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, strings, when you pass a string, um, oh yeah, sorry. The question is about when you have strings in, in your Drupal code and you're passing it through the T function, 
Um, sometimes in English, the, the string will be exactly the same, but in another language, because there's a different um, context, the translation will be different. So there is a, a context uh, that you can associate with a string, right? In the T function. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, if you look, there should be documentation on that somewhere. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question. Um, yeah, I'm. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so just to summarize, if you didn't hear that, because um, so uh, Pastor was just saying that a lot of the issues that I brought up as drawbacks and and also issues with use handling of of um, field translations are going to be fixed in a new release. So you should all go and download Entity Translation now, and then in a month you should look back for the new release and, and see how much it's even, it's even better. So that's really, that's really exciting thing. Um, I think that's all the time we have. So if, um, if anyone has more questions, um, uh, my company's booth, Evolving Web, is just out the door, so I'll be hanging out there for a while and over the next couple of days too. So feel free to come and ask more questions or come tomorrow at 11.15 to the boss. And uh, thanks so much for coming.